Good afternoon, everyone. I want to uh, thank you for coming to our webinar today. We are excited to bring this content to you. Uh, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar after um, after we're finished today, so you'll be able to have it and refer back to it. So I would like to introduce to you Jordan Jewell, who is from IDC. He's our research analyst. Brian Beckham, General Manager at Profici Proficient, and Joey Moore, uh, the Head of Product Evangelism at EpiServer. So Jordan, if you're ready to go, let's get going. I don't wanna waste anybody's time this afternoon. Sure. Thank you Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Monique. Uh, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm with IDC and we're a market research firm and um, we look at how companies are using technology and adopting technology and trends in technology. And um, what we're doing in this webinar is we're looking at how commerce and content are changing, digital experiences are changing, but also how COVID is changing the trajectory of technology and changing the trajectory of commerce as a whole. Um, so here on this slide, I'm just gonna walk through quickly some of the major points we're gonna touch on. So. Uh, there's three panelists here. I'm going to kind of take the lead, but uh, we have Joey and Brian as well, who are all going to, both of them are going to chip in when um, when we have some of these uh, panel type discussions. So I'm just going to quickly go through uh, the main slides we're going to go through. So first, we're going to talk about uh, the future of business. This is an IDC viewpoint uh, about what the future of business is going to look like and some of the trends there. Next, the future of customers. So this is uh, drilling into just a specific part of how IDC sees the future of business, focusing on the future of customers and consumers, as we call it. And we actually have survey data around um, the impact of COVID. Sorry. Uh, next is defining the experience economy. So we all have heard the term experience economy, um, and it's thrown around quite a bit, but we're gonna actually each take a crack at defining it and what it means and why it's, why it's important. Next, uh, chapters of DX, uh, digital transformation. This is looking at how IDC looks at the different stages of digital transformation that have essentially been happening since cloud has been uh, popularized. Next, commerce goes digital. This is gonna be looking at um, the, re if you look at the broader retail or commerce market as a whole, online and offline, what portion of that is digital, is e-commerce? And we're gonna talk about how COVID impacts that as well. Next, uh, digital experience platforms. This is gonna be a functional view of different layers of technology um, to form a comprehensive uh, digital commerce and digital experience platform. Um, next, uh, looking at, uh, sorry, give me one second, looking at how to deliver captivating uh, digital experiences. So here we're actually gonna each take draft picks of sorts about the, the areas of digital experiences we think are the most important. So each of the panelists will do that. Um, then we have digital experience predictions that we're gonna make. And finally, some, some of the main takeaways we think are important. And we want uh, all of you listeners to kind of walk away from this presentation with. And uh, this just shows which one of, e of each of those slides, each of those steps are gonna be panel discussions. Most of them will be and I'll kind of lay out the land for each of them, and then Brian and Joey will, will give their input, their thoughts uh, from their background. And, and just as a reminder, I come from a commerce background, so uh, I work a lot with the content management space and content in general, but I have that uh, commerce tint. So first off, um, this is how IDC, if you look on the left, this is how IDC looks at the future of enterprise. Um, so we have these future of, uh, um, kind of paradigm of some of the different areas that business is going and how technology is a part of that. Um, there's a lot there. I'm just going to focus on three very quickly. First off, the future of customers and consumers. That's the one I'm a part of at IEC, and we'll actually address that a bit more on the next slide. Future of work, which has uh, had a huge impact from COVID, as you can imagine, since many people are working from home, uh, new technologies are being adopted. Uh, to facilitate different kinds of work and just how work is changing as a whole. Um, and then finally, the future of trust, I think, is uh, also very pertinent right now. If you think about um, 
how brands need to speak to their customers and uh, trust is really uh, the lifeblood of the, the relationship between customers and uh, companies. So the future of trust is really important there and it also has to do with security. And actually what we've done at IDC is we've, since COVID really started in, in mid May, uh, March, since shutdowns started happening in the US and uh, really the impacts were being felt uh, worldwide, we started surveying the field every two weeks. And we uh, put out this question on the right, uh, on a one to four scale, we asked respondents, um, because of COVID-19, how much will your organization be prioritizing the following initiatives going forward? And um, the important thing here is that, that I wanna point out is that customer experience programs came out as the, the second most important component, which I think to a lot of listeners will make sense. We, we all think in terms of customer experience and digital experiences, but this just shows the data that during COVID, companies are double, doubling down on delivering better customer experiences, on focusing on providing value to the customer and being more empathetic. So if we, if we now drill into the, the top of that pinwheel, the future of customers and consumers, um, the, again, the one I'm a part of, here, here you can see kind of an overview of how we look at the, the future of customers and consumers. And there's a, there's a little bit going on in the slide on the left. I think the important part here is that there's a lot of different components involved with how you um, how you look at customer experience and customer value. And um, th again, this is what we found to be the second most important, oh, sorry, uh, I went ahead. Um, uh, but you can see on the right that we have a survey that we gave to the field. This was, bear in mind, this was right before COVID hit, but you could see some of the most important factors that companies selected when it came to customer experience. And uh, the, really what we found to be really important is something we call empathy at scale at IDC. So it has to do with um, being empathetic to all customers, to, um, to understand them, deliver personalized experiences, to solve help solve their problems when they might be dealing with your brand. And a, a really quick example, for instance, is airlines and how they adapted and responded to COVID because a lot of flights obviously were canceled and how they kind of adapted to that showed empathy. Um, but, but with that in mind, I wanna hand it off now, um, first off to, to Joey talking about um, what his thoughts on this slide and kind of this empathy at scale uh, idea are. Thanks, John. Yeah, I would say it's incredibly important. I think the um, the, the, the first point, that most important one about um, the, the equivalent experiences across all channels, and we, we really recognize that the, the end customer, the end consumer, doesn't differentiate between web or store, um, or mobile, all those other channels. That they're, they're having the experience with, with the brand. Um, so it's, it's important for organizations to look at how they're able to, to understand that customer behavior across those multiple, multiple touch points and, and the type of content, the type of messaging, uh, the type of communication that they're putting out that, that kind of talk to that. Um, I thought it was interesting on, on the previous slide as well where um, organizations were also looking at the amount of data that, to, to drive insights into their business. Uh, a call I had with a, with a customer in Australia this morning, one of the things they're really focusing around is making sure that they can have um, the, the, the data that they've got to support any new initiatives um, to drive in the business, where ROI becomes increasingly important. And perhaps a lot of organizations don't have the, the luxury of, of launching new initiatives without being able to back it up with really solid data. So we're seeing a lot of our customers actually using uh, the data that's available to, to actually make uh, a lot of those kind of key decisions ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I, I really like the term um, empathy at scale. Right, empathy is is such an important part of of everything that we do, uh, both as consultants and as consumers and as providers of services. Um, empathy gives us a, a shared context, right, with our with our audience. Right, it, it it helps us to connect with the need, like the the thing that they're looking for the most, and having that culture of customer centricity is really really important. Um, you know, I, when this whole thing started, no one really envisioned the 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 need for touchless pizza delivery or you know searching for toilet paper for 14 hours online but but these things happen right and we had to adapt to it very quickly and those organizations that did adapt those experiences 
to the needs of the customer and, and that had that context, those are the ones that succeeded, right? And, and they proved that that there is a difference. Uh, having an agile mindset and, and framework uh, made a huge difference for those organizations. Thanks, Brian. And I mean, there's there's tons of examples. We've all experienced how companies responded to COVID, but I think that just th this slide speaks to, if you look at the data um, about how important customer experiences, digital experiences, and this, this concept of empathy at scale is. So now um, with that in mind, uh, one of the things we wanted to set out on in this presentation was also addressing the term experience economy because it's again it's used quite often uh, in the market in the industry and um, it's kind of it's kind of used as a catch-all in some cases and it's also a buzzword so we we want to break down that buzzword and talk about what actually is the experience economy and so here I have a definition here on the right um, it's just kind of a pretty basic definition about what uh, the experience economy is. But I, I actually did some research and it's it's interesting if you look back at the usage of the word experience economy, the first time I was actually used was in uh, 1998. So over 20 years ago, the, the term experience economy was being used. And it, it really was just um, going forward from kind of uh, the agriculture economy, the industrial revolution, and uh, it's, it's just adding beyond a simple product and service. And when I think of the experience economy, um, my main takeaway, what I think about is uh, companies like Disney, where um, it, it's not just about buying products and services, it's, it's the feeling uh, that you get from the content and the messaging of Disney. And um, Disney is a, it's a huge company, it's a really obvious example, but I think every company, uh, should, who, who sells to consumers and B2B customers should be thinking about how to deliver better experiences, more engaging experiences that make um, the buyer want to be a part of that transaction, want to do business with, with a brand. Um, so, so that's kind of how I think about um, the experience economy. And now I'd like to hand it back off to Brian and hear his thoughts on, on this concept. Well, you, you know, before all of this uh, change happened, um... It, it was we saw this tremendous shift toward connecting the online uh, experience and the offline experience to the in-person experience. Now, now clearly the in-person experience changed tremendously, but it, it became you know increasingly relevant uh, to the consumer. Now, what we see is that a, a lot of industries that didn't typically have a beginning of an engagement uh, as an online transaction or as an online component, they all very quickly adopted that. Uh, and in, increase the footprint of how the transaction was happening um, with the consumer. In uh, in one area, I think that, that I could point out here is is in healthcare. Um, you know, registration online, uh, pre-screening uh, became a very 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 quickly became an online activity, whereas before that was something that was done in office. You know, validating insurance carriers and providers. Uh, you know, I, through my own personal experiences, I realized that how much they were able to shift very quickly to an online experience something that ultimately was going to end in, in something that was an in-person experience. So, you know, we saw a lot of adoption there and, and that online clearly has this massive advantage, uh, you know, touchless uh, connection with the consumer. And, and that's why that shift happened, but it happened very quickly. I, I think that that talks very clear to the point where you mentioned, talked about agility there. And we, we saw the really organizations that could suddenly pivot or move very quickly. We had, um, uh, in, in healthcare, the, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, you know, the, the, the government ministers were going on TV saying, we want you to, 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 to the public saying, you know, if you need more information, go to this website and, and check it out. And, and they, they needed to very rapidly create that content, get it out and, and be able to speak to, 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 to the, you know, the entire population in Norway because that, that was one of the things they had to do. And then on the, the, the commerce side, um, organizations, uh, manufacturers, um, uh, distributing companies that they they suddenly had to um, a lot of a lot of their the the endpoint to where they were sell to their customers whether that was um, to directly from stores they were supplying or whether it was field reps out out speaking to customers you know that channel didn't exist it got turned off overnight so we're having we were having lots of conversations with organisations saying how can we get online how can we do it quickly and of course they, those that were that had the agility mindset had the the tools available to them but also had the culture in their business. So those are the ones that managed to succeed and 
actually start to work through this and then start to have one eye on the future as well. Okay, what's it going to mean three, six, 12 months from now um, as we work our way through this? So it really, really came down to, you know, the, the winners were the ones that are able to, 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 to pivot a bit quickly uh, and to take advantage of that. Yeah, great example. Um, so I think an important part here is IDC talks a lot about digital transformation and being able to, uh, being agile and being able to kind of quickly spin up a website or spin up um, a new product line specifically for COVID or new experience, new content, all of these sort of things. Um, in many cases, companies have been preparing for years for this. They've been digitally transforming. Um, and I now want to kind of focus on digital transformation, kind of how uh, we, we, the model we have for digital transformation. So essentially when, what, what you see here is um, different chapters of digital transformation. And more specifically, um, IDC, we have what we call um, platforms of kind of technology. The first platform was uh, um, mainframe. The second one was client server. And the third essentially is cloud. So we start kind of with that cloud chapter, the third chapter as IDC calls it. Um, and so it starts around 2007. It's experiment, uh, experimentation chapter that you see on the far left was essentially when adoption was early. Companies were experimenting in the e-commerce world. You really just started to see um, online websites pick up. Mobile wasn't much of a thing at this point, but it started to become a thing. Same with social. Um, so these technologies were really in the experimentation phase. And then you move on to this multiplied innovation chapter. And this is, this is what we're currently in. Um, and, and COVID's definitely impacted it, but we're still in this chapter. And that's where these technologies really start to pay off. So it pays off a lot more to have a digital um, presence to have an online store to be across marketplaces, so on and so forth. And um, I, I, I highlighted AI and natural interfaces here, um, kind of being more intuitive for the user in, in the e-commerce world. This also has a lot to do with um, integrating with other systems, and uh, them talking to each other. And then the autonomy phase, which is sounds really far off, but is not that far off. You can see it, it starts off really in 2023 by our estimation. Now, autonomy phase is really about scalability. So there's so much data, there's so many touch points, there's, customers have very high expectations in um, the digital economy. And it's very difficult to deliver experiences that customers expect these days, who are used to Amazon, who are used to Facebook and Instagram. Um, and to really, be able to have that scale to deliver personalized experience or promotions or pricing for each customer in a, in a commerce um, view. Do that, to do that, you need to leverage things like AI. Um, we also called out um, quantum computing there and blockchain. Those sound really far off, but they'll become part of the picture really far, further down the road. But it's, it's about that scalability. It's about delivering a personalized experience um, to every customer and um, in a commerce context, that, that leads to more conversions. Um, and I'll, I'll hand it back off, uh, sorry, I skipped ahead again. Um, I'll hand it back off um, to Joey from there. No, I, I think you're absolutely right, Jordan. But one of the things when, when I look at this is really around um, a lot of the, 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 the need for organizations that have gone through some of that experimentation phase. Um, it's around uh, the, uh, an understanding what is possible. Um, and, and really sort of being able to sort of double down within their business where they see something that's successful and really you know helping drive it home, making sure they've got the, the tools to be able to do this. So organizations that maybe hadn't adopted cloud earlier on, but they were suddenly had um, really sort of unprecedented levels uh, of um, traffic to their website as they're serving increased information to their customers or where the, the digital became the single point of contact for their customers. You know, that they, they need the cloud to be able to support those types of activities. And of course, there's so much is already shifting to mobile and so much um, data being generated around that. As we, as we see um, the, the challenge for organizations now is being able to take advantage of some of those technologies um, such as AI, um, IoT, et cetera, is how they can um, consume those within their business and start to understand that how they're going to be beneficial for their organizations. Um, and again, it, it really comes down to the agility. It's making sure that you um, can start to take advantage of those 
um, so, so that they can serve your business better because um, your, your competitors certainly will be. So it's making sure that you understand that you have the tools available to, to take them on. As, as we move into the future, again, it's, it's around organizations that can really start to, to, to look ahead and think, you know, where, where, where's the industry going? What's going to be the, the expectations of the consumer? And I think one of the key things with, with this is, um, you know, I, I mentioned that we, you know, I was looking at some podcasts from last year and they were talking about, you know, what, what 2020 going to hold and no one predicted this, you know, in terms of, in terms of the, the overarching effect that it have on all of our um, businesses and organizations. So it's really around um, what, what's going to be the next thing, how are you setting your business up now uh, for next year and in the future so, so that you can respond uh, to whatever that that may be and wh whether that's something really like you know quantum computing or exponential AI what, what's the the end consumer's going to be expectations of your organization and how are you going to be able to pivot your your business to, to do that so um, it, it's around having agility as your as your business strategy effectively I'd say yeah I, I would say that this you know when i look at this slide it, it brings two thoughts to mind um to me the, the the first thing is just the importance of proper data collection and analysis right you all of these things require a tremendous amount of data and having integrity of the data that you're collecting today and having a good practice around uh, data collection aggregation uh you know building a data footprint of a consumer across multiple channels like all those things are extremely important the the other thing that i would say is you know the ability of, of organizations to embrace change. Part of this, part of the, the ability to be able to embrace these new technologies is them having strong operational processes and success, right? So none of these technologies represent a silver bullet. They, they don't, they, you know, if I, if I were to give a quantum computing system to someone who doesn't know how to use it or, or take advantage of it or leverage it or have the right processes around handling the increased volume of, of transactions it won't do them any good right so one of the things that that we work very hard in in, in adopting and in these technologies for our clients is is making sure that they have an operational processes to be able to leverage them correctly um, making sure that they have the the operational maturity to be able to do it uh, we see so many times clients go out and buy the, the latest and greatest digital experience platform not be able to leverage it only use five percent of its capabilities and you know what what was that investment really for um so leading them to the the promised land of being able to to leverage all those tools properly is is really a big key to this and and as you go further through this chart it's going to become more and more relevant right those that that never can ad adapt and adopt those technologies earlier on will never get to the end um so it becomes uh becomes a very progressive for them I think that's a really key point, and I know it's, it's something the guys at Proficient do very well, is, is actually taking the customers on a journey and helping them identify, you know, actually what, what is it that they need to take advantage of now, and sort of building a roadmap with them so you can say, you know, that the, the, there is no silver bullet in technology. What it's about is, is around how teams and organizations adopt that technology and start to use it to really realize the value of it. So, so I, I would say it's, it's a, a really key thing to make sure working with a, a trusted partner that can really help you um, see that throughout the organization. You hear the term quite often, uh, you know, digital maturity. Um, and, you know, in, in a lot of ways, digital maturity is not a new concept. It's not a new thing. It's really an organization's ability to operationalize uh, an innovation. Um, in a lot of ways and, and to understand that innovation and to organize the company around it to build the right processes and, and measures of success, et cetera, right? Those things are extremely key. So, you know, that's that's an area where, you know, to your point, Joey, a, a partner can really help, right? It's because we've seen this across so many different industries and what companies have done well and haven't done well. And uh, and we share those experiences, right? That's part of, part of our value. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, an important point that's probably pretty obvious to listeners um, is a lot of this is going to, this has changed under COVID. This is a model we created before COVID. Um, and so it's obviously, it makes sense to look at how this is going to change. Um, and so what we have next is we're focusing on specifically if I look at um, this line chart here, what it shows is the percent of U.S. retail sales that are online, that are e-commerce, you could say, um, and that's not the entire commerce market. There's there's B2B, there's other industries, but it's a good proxy for the market as a whole. And clearly, retail has been uh, very hit very hard by COVID because brick and mortar has been closed. 
Um, and so you can see at the top, I've uh, th th there's not obviously great data out there because this is a very fluid crisis and things are changing very fast. Feels like it's been two years already for some, but um, this is what we currently forecast for what that share of the market that's going online will look like. So essentially it's been a permanent, sh permanent shift uh, where more commerce is moving online and, and um, consumers and business buyers are adopting things they didn't necessarily know existed or know they had before. Um, uh, my, my boss didn't know you could order alcohol online. So that, that, that's a change that might be permanent. So things like that, there's actually been cultural changes. Um, and then to really hit the point home, uh, I put a second chart here. And that shows uh, just, just in Q2, Q1 to Q2, when really we started feeling the effects of COVID, um, what happened to brick and mortar versus online commerce. And what you might expect is that uh, brick and mortar dropped by close to 30%, whereas um, online commerce, e-commerce jumped up, which again, we, we probably would have expected, bear in mind brick and mortar accounts for a much bigger portion of the market, it accounts for 90 or so percent of the market, depending on how you define it. But um, I mean, obviously these, this is very, it's a huge change in a very short amount of time. And this is where being agile, um, being able to kind of leverage those technologies we've already talked about is extremely important. Um, so from there, I'm gonna pass it back off to Brian to give his input on, on this slide. Yeah, you know, it, <laughs> This is also interesting The you know, clearly nobody could have predicted this and the rate of change was remarkable, like how quickly this all happened for us um, in different regions. And there was very little time to prepare. I think we probably had more time to prepare in the United States than, than a lot of countries did, but, but th there was very little time to prepare for any of these changes. Um, the the long-term impacts to me are the most important part of this like which one of these changes are going to become permanent or preferred options in terms of of the commerce journeys etc and I, I have to admit i really enjoyed pulling up to the grocery store and somebody putting the groceries in the trunk for me that was fantastic um i also liked shopping for cars online and uh, them delivering a car for a test drive to my house uh, i thought those things were fantastic now the, the question becomes which one of those actually will work at scale, right? Because they had such low volumes of transactions that that they could do those kinds of things. They were reaching out for, for much smaller markets. So they were looking for innovative ways to approach and connect with a consumer in those meaningful ways. But but again, there were some innovations there, some approaches that, that I really appreciated as a consumer and, and enjoyed tremendously. So. And I suppose that is, it's those organizations that are able to scale that, that, that kind of innovation where they recognize that customers uh, want this, you know, will come to expect some of these kind of things and it'll be those organizations that can kind of deliver on that. So, so I think it's, it is that kind of that seismic shift that we've seen. And, and you know, I, I, I know in, in some similar data from the UK where the e-commerce e um, six months ago was 18, almost 19% of um, all retail transactions. And that's gone up to over 31%. So in terms of um, where people, um, you know, my, my parents, for example, have never done grocery shopping online before. There's no way they're gonna go back to, to you know, spending half an hour in the car to go to the store, walk around the store for an hour, get back in the car and head home because they, they, they find it so much easier. So, so you know, I, I think that this is a pretty conservative um, look at how people are actually gonna go back to the way that things were before in, in terms of their Sunday shopping things. So, um, I, I think convenience is, is really gonna gonna come out in, in all of this. Yeah, and, and actually, Jordan, I didn't know you could get alcohol online either. So I took a note of that. I think that's a very important thing to understand. <laughs> but but the, the alcohol thing actually also speaks to to changes in regulation, right? Yeah. So there's a number of regulations in you know everywhere, right? That determines things like like where are you allowed to buy a car online? So cars have to have dealerships in certain states in order to be able to so what what kind of restrictions are, are going to loosen uh, regulatory issues that, that will free the consumer more as a part of this? And it's it's very easy for the government to to kind of give away a little more capability. And, and what of those things become permanent as well? And, and that's also another fascinating aspect of this. I mean, we, we saw it with um, where just in store transactions, Apple Pay used to generally have a, a you know, $50 limit or 50 pound limit. 
Um, and overnight, they, they increased it to 250. So, yeah. and cash just went out the window and everyone started, um, you have to pay if you go into a store, now you have to pay um, on your mobile phone. So, so you know, that's again, something that's become the, the, the new normal in, in so many instances. And that's not going to revert back to what it was. People don't, you know, I haven't picked, take my wallet out of my drawer for like two months. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, usually the, the, they won't take those rights back away, right? So it, it, that will very quickly become the new normal. And, and I think that that's, that's an exciting part of this, but, but we'll have to see um, you know, what that new normal is. But, but again, there's a lot of really preferred options that have emerged out of this and, and how they become permanent is gonna be a really fascinating thing to watch. Yeah, and, and even though I essentially created this chart and it's my data, um, I also agree that it's, conservative. Um, I, I mean, I'm an e-commerce analyst, so I'm biased, but I think the ship is bigger than that. But right now, I'd say most of the, there's this kind of expectation that it's going to go relatively back to normal. Um, this is this is the data point I was looking at recently. I'm just throwing it in there. Um, if you look at uh, how much retail space there is by square foot per capita by country, and I'm in, I'm in the U.S., um, the US, I think it's around 23 square feet per capita. And if you look at Germany, for instance, it's 2.3. It's about one-tenth the size. It's it's kind of crazy if you look at it. I, I recommend just looking into that. It's kind of nuts. Um, but I think things like that are going to change because of this. And, and retail was already having issues with things like malls, and that was already going to be a shift. And you have to think about how commercial businesses are going to shift. So there's a lot of permanent shift that's going to happen. It's really hard to anticipate now, but these are all kind of components that that are that are impacting the market. And I would actually agree against my own forecast that it's conservative, um, but it's it's really hard not to be conservative right now. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to, uh, the next area we're going to go into is um, looking into some of the functional areas that um, we, we, we include in a digital experience platform. Let's really focus on the technology at hand here. Um, and, and again, I'm a digital commerce analyst, so this is very skewed toward commerce. You can see the commerce layer there is, um, it's really relatively expanded, whereas the purple layer, the customer experience layer, could be th twice or three times as, as tall. Um, but we're just going to quickly talk to this, and I'm going to take out some of the other areas that we're not as interested in. and um, this is how I view the market, essentially. This is how I view the commerce market. But I want to hand it off um, to uh, to Joey first to get his opinion about um, kind of what he sees at EpiServer and their kind of view of the, the market from a functional view. I, I think one of the things we talk about now is more, more true than ever is, is you know everybody buys. Um, so whether you're a manufacturing company or, or, or in healthcare or, or financial services, whatever organization it is, then there is a transaction happening somewhere in the value chain. That's, that's how, you, how you're in business. And so when we talk about commerce, there's a very broad um, scope that, that, that you can actually look at. So organization, you know, I've worked with um, plenty of the you know, 100 year plus organizations, a, a customer of ours, the Royal Mint in the UK is, is a, an 1100 year old um, organization. And so for them to, to how they've started moving and, and selling more and more online and, and transacting online, not only to um, you know, then consumers around collect, collectibles and gifts and things, but also you know, they, they supply currency to 61 um, different countries. And so how, they, how they're having their, how they're managing and maintaining those relationships in a digital fashion, whereas before a lot of it um, would, would have been uh, performed face to face. So in terms of the, the, the elements to a, a platform, I, mean, I would say, as you're looking at what what they have, really understand the roadmap as well. Make sure that you understand that the the, the, the platform you're working with or, or looking at really has a clear vision for the future and the future for, you, for your industry, and make sure that they can um, adapt and serve serve you as well. So, and that that would be my sort of key takeaway is really understanding it, you know that everything you know, fit for purpose. When I when I look at this slide. Uh... I have to admit it it kind of drives up my anxiety level because I think integrations like integrations are everywhere right so but but it does speak to the amount of specialization that has that has now been engineered into into commerce and digital experience platforms it's no longer you know single kind of monolithic architectures and products that dominate everything it's 
you know, organizations have very specific needs in different areas and, and being able to bring uh, best of breed solutions into a number of different areas and integrate them together into a cohesive solution is very important. But, but the other thing that I would stress here is like how these integrations are dealt with and done um, is extremely important. Uh, you can build uh, integrations in a thoughtful way and, and they, the, what I always kind of think about a thoughtful integration is one that doesn't place severe operational strain on an organization to be able to support and maintain it or right, manage it. Um, and then also leveraging things like integration platforms is, is kind of important because, you know, doing it right means that you can continually, uh, you know, refresh and, and adapt new best of breed technologies and approaches into your, into your ecosystem. Um, so looking at this breakdown, it, it's it's kind of a very thorough look at at the different bits and pieces that that consumers or that that companies that are offering products and services have to choose from. And I think it's uh, it's definitely something that we see and experience every day at Proficient. So I, I think that that integration piece is absolutely key. You know, you you got to have a platform that plays well, um, is interoperable with, with with other solutions because it's not going to be the the only thing within within your um, uh, within your stack that need, need, you need, need to work with, so it needs to be able to work very effectively with other platforms. Very, very true. And it's like both ends of the spectrum in a lot of ways, right? There are some some organizations that don't have very sophisticated supply chain management processes and operations, and and they can use more of a of an out of the box solution. And there there are a lot of good ones, but but also products have to be able to to adapt and connect. All right, so they have to be architected in such a way that they're they're willing to give away some functionality so that you can plug in an external engine or another product to be able to service that part of it. And and what we see again is is uh, you know especially with the organizations that that we partner with, you know, EpiServer included, that that's that's a very important aspect of the success of that platform. Um, and they do it very well. Like the the maturity of products in this space today is is extremely high. And, and so we do have that opportunity, um, you know, working with those larger organizations that do have these really uh, kind of sophisticated needs. Like we, we very confident that, that uh, you know, there is always a best of breed solution to the problem that they bring to the table. Yeah, and I would say, um, looking at this from a commerce perspective, like to that exact point, um, headless commerce and headless content has been probably the buzzword of, of last year, I guess I would say for me in, in covering the commerce space. Um, and it speaks exactly to the importance of integration. So integrating the commerce engine with the, the front office and the presentation layer. Um, and and that, that's catching on and it's, it's, it really has to do with the best of breed strategy, adopting that kind of strategy um, to, to kind of account for how channels and uh, devices and how can people purchase and browse essentially. Um, I would like to, so the next slide, I'd like to back up. So we've looked at the technology, we've looked at kind of functionally what you need to succeed, but we kind of think more in, I guess you'd call it a philosophical standpoint, or um, it, it's both a mix of technology and kind of uh, processes. This is this is what we, um, uh, what I authored in the, the components you really need, some of the major components, um, and it's not uh, exhaustive, but these are the, some of the major components that I put together for delivering captivating digital experiences. Um, and we thought it would be fun if each of us, all three of us, took kind of sides, took picks, and just talked about three each that we think are worth mentioning, worth kind of diving a bit deeper in, because there's a lot going on in this, this pinwheel. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to go um, go into my three. And I'm, again, I'm a commerce analyst, so I'm going to, of course, go into frictionless commerce. Um, and what we've seen in commerce is that um, removing friction is kind of almost always going to be uh, a path to success. Customers want to more often than not get into a store, get out, get what they need. And you especially see that in the B2B world where uh, B2B shoppers, businesses, they don't, they don't really want to shop, essentially. Shop is not the right word. They just want to get in, get what they need for their business, to do their job, and get out. Um, and frictionless commerce has become uh, any way to enable uh, to, to remove friction from the commerce process is really um, going to be a path to success. Um, Omni experiences, this is a little bit more than just omni-channel, which is also a term thrown around quite a bit. When I'm talking about omni experiences, I'm thinking about just that the experience, whether it's commerce, content, um, marketing, customer service, all these kind of customer-facing components 
that it's the same across different channels. So that when you're um, working, you're interacting with a company on um, customer service, they have access to your browsing history and your orders and your preferences from a commerce site or vice versa. And it, it doesn't have to do just with commerce again, it can be on content and delivering the same content across different channels. Um, and finally, security and trust. Um, we all know the importance of security, but I again wanna just drill home uh, the concept that um, trust is really become the currency for customer experience at this point. Um, it has to do with that empathy at scale as well, but customers won't buy from a company they don't trust. And you wanna be really, um, you wanna inform your customers about their data privacy. You wanna be careful about how you treat the security portion, but also data privacy. And you wanna make sure when you're delivering a very personalized experience, a, a great personalized experience, you're not going a little bit too far and getting kind of into the, the creepy zone, I guess you could call it, where a consumer or B2B customers, how, how did they get this information? So those are three things I um, wanted to call out. And then uh, now it's Joey's turn to kind of go through through his picks. I, I, I thought it a really interesting one there when, when you talk, talked around frictionless commerce. So, so for me, frictionless commerce and personalization are really intertwined. It's, you know, we, we, we make the same differentiation between um, shopping and what we could call buying. And then some, some people will come on and they have um, you know, the, 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 the busy chef who's coming on ordering his catering supplies for the, for the week. Um, that They know exactly what they want. They want to come on, get their order, um, get out. And then personalization is actually able to, to deliver um, on one side the, 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 the products, the right products for that person, but also able to deliver um, content um, to the end user as well and actually be able to um, make sure that they're serving them the right content. One of the things we've seen through COVID um, is, is that the organization didn't know what kind of content it was that, that, that users were coming to their site, what do they need to know? And so providing really robust content analytics as well, so I can see, well, what are people engaging with? What are the topics they're interested in? And um, how do we serve that back to our users? And so using personalization to really answer those two things about recognizing shoppers and buyers, but also recognizing people who need more information to, to take them on that journey to actually help make them make that decision. And then ultimately, once you've got that intelligence, it's around the content engine. It's around being able to um, serve the right thing to, to, to the right customer, be able to create that content in really agile world, be able to respond. Um, I think, as you mentioned earlier, Jordan, this is very, very fast moving. You know, what week to week is, is new things that are occurring and the new regulations coming in um, as things start to open up in various regions as well, is you need to be able to adapt and create and update your content very quickly. So the old school days of um, wanting to change a, a landing page or, or change a piece of content on the website and, you know, writing it up, sending it off to IT, a few days to put it up on the web, you know, that, 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 that can't exist anymore. You need to be able to respond, not quite in real time, but very, very close to it. So, so having a really robust um, content engine where you can actually um, adapt those experiences to, to the to the surrounding um, atmosphere is important. I think you know it's a good point, Joey. The one thing that I would I would point out on the content engine side is that not all content engines are are the same, right? The 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 amount of capability, like changing content very deep within a buy journey, right? Sometimes those areas kind of struggle for manageability. Uh, so how it's implemented and, and the strength of that content engine can make a huge difference, right? But to me, the key is, you know, being able to manage as much of the experience and the content as possible without having any dependencies on IT, right? Because in order to move quickly, in order to move in an agile way, you, you can't have that, right? And why implement a digital experience platform, CMS platform, et cetera, if you can't do that, right? So that those things are really important. We, we saw a tremendous amount of, of movement clearly in content and creating and crafting new experiences to help help our clients reach out to customers and to assure them of, of safety and security and, and continuity plans and those kinds of things around COVID when these, when these events happen, but also talking to their suppliers about handling mechanisms of products and, and those kinds of things. And those, those content engines, uh, again, they, they did not have the time to go through development life cycles. So it was something that if we didn't have reusable component architectures and, and the ability to deliver content very quickly with, you know, not a predicated design, but, you know, something that came in a very ad hoc way, uh, they, they were able to respond very quickly. 
and again, that's that's a, a measure of agility when you have a content engine that has that capability. Um, the I guess the the other things that I would say development tools. I when I when I think about development tools, and I you know I am an engineer, but when I think about development tools, I think about all the tools that are a part of that delivery process. And and two things that I think are are maybe not leveraged highly enough or, or or that should be leveraged higher in order to increase the speed of delivery you know first of all automation deployment automation management those things are extremely important and organizations that that can embrace that that level of automation in their delivery process is super important for them to be able to do that to not just a quality issue but but again a, a speed and agility issue uh, but other areas where, where we see, um, uh, you know, where these development tools can make a big difference is actually in quality assurance. So organizations that can properly leverage tooling around the quality assurance process to automate testing um, as much as humanly possible. Um, you know, unit testing and integration testing, all those things being said too, but, but also in non-functional areas. So things like testing for accessibility. Um, you know, a lot of our partners uh, bring products to bear that will monitor the accessibility and compliance of a site and help you respond very quickly to it in a, in a live way. Um, you know, those kinds of tools can, can make a huge difference for an organization. And those processes are very, very expensive to manage. So applying automation in those areas like, has a huge impact on it. And, you know, on the, on the previous slide, we also talked about integrations um, and integration frameworks. Um, Things like, uh, uh, you know, integration platform as a service layers, uh, you know, microservices architectures, you know, different ways that, that organizations build an integration framework, again, for, for thoughtful integrations, but doing so in a way that allows you to continually evolve and adopt and adapt new technologies and best of breed technologies is very important. Um, you know, we, we talk about integrations to, to some degree as almost being plug and play. If, if I do this correctly, I should be able to detach an integration and plug another one in without having to a ripple effect across the entire ecosystem. Um, and those, you know, doing those things right it takes a little bit more of an investment, a little bit more time, but but there's a big benefit to it over the long run. And and events like this only underscore the need to be able to change and adapt very quickly. Extremely important. Awesome. Yeah. So we've we've all kind of given our view. I, I thought that was probably the most fun discussion of of these slides. Um, I do want to get, so I'm going to take the reins back and just go over some some quick predictions that um, the team and I have put together for um, the, the whole digital experience uh, platform market. Um, and we're, we do want to leave some time for questions, so I'm going to go through them a little bit quickly, but you can try to guess what some of the predictions are looking at the left, like the one with the jack-o'-lantern, but I'm just going to go through them. So first is channel explosion. Essentially, the number of channels um, that commerce can happen is exploding, it's growing very quickly, and we can't anticipate what those channels of the future are gonna be. So the prediction is that by 2023, uh, both B2C and B2B buyers in the US will interact with over five touch points on average for every purchase. And I don't have the number right in front of me right now, but I think if you look back in 2010, the average was about a little over two. Um, once you include B2B, it's, it's higher in B2C, so that number's increased quite a bit. Um, next, experience versus price. So the prediction here is that there's there's kind of been a divide occurring in the commerce market between prioritizing uh, the experience and prior, prioritizing the price with Amazon, companies like Amazon focusing more on price. Um, so we predict as Amazon and companies like them take up a bigger portion of the market, which they have over the years, now accounting for over 50% of all um, e-commerce transactions in the US, for instance, um, that gap is gonna widen. And you really are gonna have to focus in and create differentiation kind of on either end of that spectrum. And you can survive in the middle, but you do have to have kind of a component otherwise. And we see that widening. Um, next is going headless. Like we mentioned, headless has become a very popular term. And we forecast that by uh, 2024, 25% of all mid-market and enterprise merchants will leverage headless content and commerce architecture to drive value. Um, if you look at SMB, this number would be smaller, so that's why we did mid-market and enterprise, but we do see headless catching on uh, quite a bit. Uh, next, we're looking at um, best-in-class uh, solutions for software and, and, and technology in general, and the forecast is that it, in the coming years, 
um, brands and merchants will purchase from a larger number of best of breed technologies and kind of stitch them together more often versus going with a more monolithic or sweet play um, te technology or commerce space. And that's definitely a trend I've been seeing as I um, analyze and compare companies in the market. And then finally, um, I call it getting personal. It's essentially looking at personalization. Uh, the forecast is that by 2025, over half of all digital experiences uh, will leverage AI to deliver personalized contextual experiences. And I think that contextual piece is extremely important. Um, companies like EpiServer are doing a good job at this, but I think there's not enough focus on that contextual piece. There's a lot of personalization based on segmenting up your, your customers and just delivering content or promotions based on their segment. Uh, and the prediction here is that it's gonna become more contextualized. It's gonna be based more on their current session on your site or trends that are happening lately versus just they are this old and they live in this market and they're this gender, so on and so forth. So that's kind of the idea there. And again, we're running a little bit uh, over on time. We kind of wanted to leave some time for questions. Uh, these are the main takeaways we have for the market. It's really just the things that we've been talking about um, over over the over this presentation. The the first one's pretty obvious. You need to move fast in, in the post COVID world. It, that was true before COVID, and it's even more true afterwards. And it's not just technology; it's technology, uh, people, and training, and customer service um, programs and processes around that. Um, second. Uh, organizations need to be ruthless in their prioritization. This really has to do with that best of breed and um, price versus experience. So you really need to focus on what you wanna do and deliver that customer experience, that, that strategy flawlessly. Um, digital transformation uh, is as much about building a strong operational model to aligning distant groups. This is essentially about breaking down silos. We see often that um, in the content and commerce and marketing spaces, these tend to be different portions of an organization, different silos, and they're not talking to each other all the time. So when someone, when a marketer wants to change some content for, for a campaign, they often have to go to a developer to, to do so. Um, and these, these teams should be talking to each other more. It's very important and increasing in importance. Uh, second to the last, uh, adaption of new technologies relies on an agile mindset. We've been saying it throughout, so I won't harp on it too much more, but this has been uh, this really escalated during COVID is kind of, I think, the main takeaway. And then finally, if you want to grow um, into autonomous systems it, on that last curve on the right, um, you need to be focused on the teams and the roles and um, the processes around those teams. It's not just, again, about finding a, trying to find a silver bullet technology. It's about um, building a strategy and a team to do so. And with that, we would like to, uh, with the remaining time we have, turn it over to, to any questions um, that the audience has uh, brought up and answer any kind of questions in panel format as best we can. Thank you so much, Jordan. We've had a couple of questions really asking about specific examples. Brian and Joey, do you guys have any examples of companies who really did have to pivot in COVID and, and can share kind of how they did that. People are really looking for some practical examples. Yeah, so, so, so I think one is we saw um, a very large uh, grocery chain that was actually um, 1500 store chain that, that, that needed, that didn't historically sell online um, and they were actually recognized when the business said they had a got a sort of a potentially vulnerable customer base as well. So for them actually turning around very, very quickly, it was actually just a matter of weeks that they're actually able to launch a fully fledged, um, turn, turn their normal sort of brochureware site into a fully fledged e-commerce site. And that, that was really, really key for them to be able to, you know, continue to serve their customers. You know, there's, Ultimately, they don't want to lose customers to competitors, but for them, it was, it was part of their ethos that they would can kind of continue to be able to serve them throughout this. So it was a fully fledged e-commerce site with all the um, bells and whistles you would expect, but it was as much about um, the, the, the speed to adapt as it was around um, the kind of the, the, the technical side, because it meant some big changes in their the business as well. 
Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the organizations that we that we work with on a day to day basis that they were already in the process of implementing, you know, commerce or, or we already had the the early stages of commerce implemented on those systems and and so there wasn't a, a massive pivot. But one company does come to mind um, that we were working very closely with during during this event and just to see the change that happened inside the organization. This is a a global organization that that specializes in in home comfort products and and the thing that that we saw was their mindset very quickly changed to much more agile mindset the um, it, it you know when you see these large organizations sometimes decisions and processes can kind of get in the way of of innovation and speed uh, but the company very quickly pivoted on that and changed and embraced uh, embraced a much more agile philosophy the the thing that we saw initially again was this kind of massive output of, of content and, and for them they're both a b2b and a b2c organization but so they had multiple communication channels that were going out to ensure like their distributors around packaging and the safety of packaging and delivery and you know what products were going to be going through in terms of uh, uh you know any kind of a delay in shipping because of you know anything that was going on with china at that point uh, then also talking to their consumers about about the handling of the products and and so on, um, and then supporting their consumers to be able to do more themselves, and not to rely solely on the pros to to help them. So DIY and self service and support became a, a much bigger priority for them very quickly, and they made those investments very rapidly. I'm not going to add anything. You guys nailed it. <laughs> um, we I, we've got time for maybe one more question. Let me see here. Um, what is or is not included in the U.S. e-commerce forecast? Sure, let me pull that back up. It's it's a little complicated, um, and this data specifically here it is. This data is specifically by um, e-marketers or, or the base data, I should say at least, um, and they don't and do include certain things. I'd say if, generally, if you look at like the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, market. Um, what they define as retail um, does include things like the sale of cars and gasoline. And although some of that's moved online, it's predominantly offline, and that skews the numbers quite a bit. Um, and uh, eMarketers also does some interesting things, like they don't include gambling, I think, and things like that. So that, that also plays into this number. I think if you look at some other sources, it's quite a bit higher. Um, and I would actually say if you – if you look at markets we're all kind of used to when we think of e-commerce like apparel or um, CPG type products, um, that that probably skews higher. It's quite a bit higher, I think. Um, don't have the data right in front of me, but um, that also played into kind of being a little bit conservative with these numbers because it's still really just panning out. I, I would expect this number, I could definitely see a scenario where this number was higher post-COVID. I would also say um e-marketers initial forecast was a bit lower than this they, they had their own forecast i use my own but e-marketers forecast what would have been the green line was lower so they didn't predict it taking up quite as much of the market but that was also partly because we kind of went back to opening up in the us and other countries and then have scaled that back a bit so it's really in flux and um so that's really it's really hard to get good data right now but I'm, uh, that's one of the main in inquiries and questions I get. One more question, guys. I know we are running out of time, but this was a great one that just came through. Um, a listener asked, what about the key skills that you think are required in the future and the talent that you would advise organizations to uh, hire for to really uh, cope and thrive with, with this new situation? <laughs> I, 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 the big question. <laughs> I, I have the idea of the, you know the T-shaped individuals who can kind of go broad across a, a whole range of different things, but also be able to go deep in in, in certain things. But well. I think being able to to bring those people on your team who have a little bit of go deep as necessary as well. I think from a from a technical standpoint, and, and again looking at the delivery of these kind of online experiences, right the 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 one thing that i that i have seen that's kind of a, an increasingly important role is someone that can bridge the gap between 
creative and experienced design and implementations. And we refer to these like a digital product owner of some sort, but but someone that that really can um, you know connect the empathy of the customer and the the desire and the needs of the client to an implementation plan uh, to reduce friction organizationally and to be able to deliver these experiences a lot faster. Um, that that's a that's a role that I see as emerging key in order to speed up that process. Yeah, I don't have. Uh, I don't. I'm not going to add anything. We're we're basically at time. I think I I would definitely agree with Joey that um, I often see e-commerce managers who I interview a lot. They didn't necessarily come from strictly an e-commerce background. They might have come from marketing or content or something else, um, and then they got thrust into that position to kind of launch an e-commerce site. And I would say you you do need to kind of understand a lot of different components. So just being open to um, working in SEO and advertisement and kind of some of the, being 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 open to going across these silos and across technology and business I think is really important. All right, well that will wrap us up. I want to thank everybody for joining today. We will send you the recording of uh, today's chat. And if you have any questions for Proficient, for EpiServer, for IDC, please reach out and we will get those questions answered for you. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Bob. Cheers, guys.